At some point, everyone has a love-hate relationship at work. If you don't believe me, ask yourself how you feel about working on a Monday morning after a three-day weekend. And I admit that my job is no different. Most of the time, I enjoy what I do. But there are days when I wish I could stay in bed. I love my job when I can tell someone news that changes their life. I hate my job when someone points a gun in my face and threatens to kill me. You see, I'm a court courier. I hope not many of you have met me or someone like me. I'm the guy who walks up to people at the worst time in their lives, asks them their name, and hands them an envelope that says, Official Delivery. I'm the guy who hands out divorce papers to people. This is not a glamorous job. And, of course, the pay is low, but it's never boring. Let me tell you a little about what I do. The company I work for serves county courts and most local law firms to deliver legal documents to people. I know it sounds like I'm a glorified courier, but sometimes it involves more than just handing someone a document, tucking your tail between your legs and running away. Sometimes it takes cunning and courage to do what I do. Since I'm the smallest person on the corporate totem pole and the youngest at 26, I get to do the least glamorous deliveries. I have to serve divorce notices. I do this because they turn out to be the least dangerous thing we do, at least most of the time. In our county, the courts may serve divorce papers in several ways. Certified letter with return receipt requested, service by an officer from the county sheriff's office, private courier delivery, or through friends. I believe most deliveries are made by certified mail because there are a lot of irreconcilable differences these days. The county sheriff will intervene at the request of the complainant, or the court, usually when violence is expected on the part of the recipient. Friends can also deliver documents, and usually they are given by one spouse to the other. This is in cases of amicable divorces, or when someone pays too little for their delivery. The ones our company receives usually happen when the filing spouse wants to surprise the other, or when they simply don't want to meet with them. We can deliver anytime, anywhere, and many of our deliveries are ones where the recipient has no idea what might happen. I go to their home, work, or social event and do my thing. I call this blind delivery. From time to time, we need to look for a recipient because they have moved without leaving a forwarding address. And several times a year, we have to watch a home or place of business because they are trying to avoid the inevitable. I call them runners. In the four years that I've been doing this, only one person has managed to escape me. He appeared in Canada under an assumed name. In the end, the delivery was carried out by a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Thanks to the internet, you can run away, but you cannot hide. Over the years, I've accumulated many stories about my work, some of which are suitable for telling friends at parties or at the local bar, but most I prefer to keep secret. There are two that, if I ever told anyone, I would get in big trouble. Let me talk about a typical delivery before I get into the ones I haven't told anyone about before. Last week, I needed to make two deliveries, both in the blind category and both had a profound impact on me, each in their own way. The first was for a well-known woman in our community. The husband asked that we present the papers during the evening award ceremony where the wife was receiving the Woman of the Year Award from the local JCs. It was an invitation-only event, so I dressed up as a waiter and mingled with the staff. I even served drinks to several tables while I waited. The husband asked me to hand the documents to his ex-wife while she was giving her acceptance speech. I thought it was a little dirty, but I don't get paid to think. During her introduction, the announcer showed a photo montage of her accomplishments on a video screen above the podium, along with several family photos of her with her husband and two children. The announcer must have said a dozen times what a wonderful mother and wife this woman was. Few people knew what she did in her free time. Let me tell you that I never make deliveries without first checking the documents inside the envelope. I read everything to make sure I have the right person and check for any other relevant information that might make my job easier. Sometimes I giggle at what's about to happen, and sometimes I don't like being the source of bad news. In most cases, there is not enough information to judge what the person... They showed her in bed with a man and a woman doing things I had only seen in adult films. The man in the photo was not her husband. 
I remember seeing the two of them in the newspapers several times. He was a member of the local council, and the woman was the sister of the recipient of the documents. I just grinned at the photos, adjusting the contents of my pants, because, as I said, the photos were very revealing. Regardless, the award ceremony was supposed to be the culmination of a long career for this woman, and I was going to ruin it big time. After she was introduced, she began to speak. I set down the tray of glasses, straightened the waiter's white jacket, and calmly walked to the front of the room. I stood one and a half meters from the podium and looked at her. She looked at me for a moment, wondering why the waiter was standing there. I didn't say a word until she stopped and glared at me. What do you want? She asked angrily, pressing her hand over the microphone. Are you Elizabeth Hansen? I asked calmly. She looked down at me as if I was some kind of idiot. Of course, it's me. Who do you think this is all for? She said, sweeping her hand from one end of the room to the other to represent the crowd of adoring fans sitting in front of her. I took a large manila envelope from the waiter's jacket and handed it to her. She looked at me as if I was crazy, but I stood there silently, holding the envelope in my hand. About this time, two very large men came up behind me and stood with their hands on my shoulders. The woman's curiosity must have gotten the better of her, because she reached out and took the envelope. When she did this, I said simply and loudly enough, Madam, this is an official presentation. I turned and smiled at the two large men behind me and walked between them towards the exit, looking over my shoulder. The crowd was seething, chattering, and as I passed, they pointed at me as if I had three heads. Before I got to the door, I heard a scream and turned to look. The woman on the stage whom I had just served was on her knees, covering her mouth with her hands, and staring in horror at the screen above the podium. The slideshow on the screen included the photographs I had seen in the envelope. I don't know how he arranged it, but it looks like her husband just exposed her to everyone, who could have been anyone. I walked away chuckling with a giant smile on my face. The next day I read in the newspaper about the action-packed JC Awards dinner that had taken place the night before. The photo of the woman I served was at the very beginning of the article about her and her sister and their affair with one of the county council members, as well as their impending divorce. Of course, there were no explicit photos, but it did say that the JCs took back the Woman of the Year Award. This is one example where I really enjoyed my job. Before I talk about the second delivery I made, I want to say that I believe in the sanctity of marriage, and that any spouse who cheats on another deserves every nastiness and nastiness thrown their way. I don't care if the husband had sex with his secretary at work or the wife was still dating her old college boyfriend. Cheating of any kind is simply wrong. I know it's completely black and white, but that's how my parents raised me and that's how I feel. And I am for retribution. I'm not sure I believe in retaliation when one party is physically harmed or children are affected, but publishing a spouse's hurtful exploits on the front page of the local newspaper is fine by me. My dad always said, don't do anything like that unless you want it on the front page of the Washington Post. The second delivery was the complete opposite of the first. As usual, I reviewed the documents before leaving the office, but could not say anything about the woman I was supposed to serve or the circumstances of the divorce. I was going in blind, but more than half of my work is like that. I'm a professional and I just do my job and then slowly back away. I remember serving a woman in her office on my first day of work, and as I turned to leave, a stapler whizzed past my ear. I turned and looked back, and she was ready to throw the phone at me as I turned left down the aisle and quickened my pace towards the exit of the building. Since it was my first day, I was monitored and mentored by another courier during this time. He told me, rolling around on the floor laughing, that I had just learned lesson number one. Never turn your back on someone you just served. To this day, I always back away after handing over or at least look over my shoulder while running. Sorry, I'm a little lost. Anyway, the second delivery was made to a house in a quiet suburb for a woman named Lucille. It was an ordinary country house, a white picket fence, children's toys in the yard, a beat-up old car in the driveway, the usual. 
I knocked on the screen door and a young woman approached with a baby on her hip and in curlers. Yes, she said in a soft southern accent. Excuse me, but are you Lucille Rogers? Yes, it's me. It is for you. I handed over the manila envelope. What is this? she asked, opening the screen door and taking him in. I did what I usually do and simply said, This is an official presentation. Ha! Huh, what is this? I don't understand. My husband is not at home right now. I'll give this to him when he arrives. Ma'am, I think you should read this, I warned. These are documents from your husband who is suing you for divorce. I started to back away when I noticed her expression change. I've seen him many times before. She had no idea this would happen, and now she held in her hands proof of the complete destruction of her world. I could almost see the wheels in her head stop, not understanding anything anymore. Now her eyes were shining with tears. All that came out of her mouth was, I, I, I. She leaned against the door lock and slumped into a heap on the floor, sobbing. There was nothing I could do for her, so I backed away and walked to my car. That's when I heard a scream. I looked back and saw her lying prostrate on the sidewalk with her baby in the grass next to her, screaming and pounding on the concrete. I started to return to try to do something when I saw a neighbor running towards her. She alternated between looking at me and the woman, trying to figure out what was wrong and whether I was going to hurt her. She knelt down and picked up the baby, watching me the whole time. I got into the car and drove away. I felt like crap for the rest of the day. This is the downside of my job, seeing an innocent person go from the normal world to a post-apocalyptic existence in seconds. As I said, I am the smallest person on the totem pole in my office, and my colleagues with any seniority serving divorce papers have already experienced the bitterness of both the recipient and their own. They've all been in my place, and now it's my turn. My boss said it affects everyone differently, but personally, I only enjoy watching a person's life blow up when they do bad things themselves. But I really can't stand to see someone innocent who has done nothing but love and trust in their spouse royally screwed up. That's just who I am. By the way, I pick up stray puppies and find them a good home. I have two stories that I have never told, primarily because if anyone ever found out, I would be out of a job in no time. What I did was unprofessional and against my company's rules, but I damn well enjoyed it. Every time I remember them, I smile. About a year after I started working for the company, I had to apply to be a vice president at a bank downtown. She was a strong woman, smart, beautiful, and stubborn. I made an appointment with her just before lunch, saying I wanted to talk about a business loan, and I had plenty of time to wait. When she left the office, my jaw dropped into my lap. She didn't come up, but seemed to float up to me with an outstretched hand and a smile that brings the dead back to life. The gray business suit she wore showed off her amazing body to the best advantage. Her ample round breasts pushed her white blouse forward just enough to make me drool. Her skirt was cut just above her knees to frame some of the most gorgeous tanned legs outside of Radio City Music Hall, and her long, wavy blonde hair fell over her shoulders. An absolute dream stood in front of me, holding out its hand, waiting for me to return to reality. I not only lusted, but perhaps also loved. Hmm. She made a sound, bringing my mind back to this world. I stood up, looked into her gorgeous blue eyes, and stammered, saying, are you, are you Alethea Robertson? Yes. What can I do for you today? While she was saying this, the smile did not leave her magnificent lips. I could hardly do what I came to do. I couldn't offend the future mother of my children. I wanted to marry her, take all the worries of the world away from her, and have many children with her. This was what my mind wanted, but my body had another idea. I handed her the manila envelope. What is this? she asked, taking it from me, letting her fingertips gently touch the back of my hand. Oh God, I wanted this woman. This is an official presentation, I muttered very quietly and timidly and quickly looked away. I didn't want to see her in pain. After a short pause, she simply said, Thank you. She was nothing other than the goddess incarnate. Please come to my office. I followed her like an obedient puppy, without a single thought in my head. Sharon, please don't connect me with anyone for a while. 
she purred to her secretary as she walked past. Once in her office, she closed the door and threw the envelope on the table. So this bastard has finally decided to divorce me? Well, it wasn't a surprise, after all. He's been having sex with his secretary for the last six months. Okay, his loss. She turned and stood with her arms crossed and looking out the window, blessing me with the sight of her magnificent ass. Looking at the gray skirt which bulged out just enough to highlight the shapely hips below, I felt something move in my pants. I immediately felt uneasy, but I didn't want this beauty to see how I was trying to solve the problem and think that I was playing with myself, just not that I urgently needed it. Yes, it's his loss, but it's your lucky day, she said, turning again with a life-restoring smile. A, eh? I didn't see anything except that smile. What is your name? Bob. Well, Bob, you seem to be feeling uncomfortable. Let me help you. She then did what I can only describe as heaven on earth. She leaned forward and pressed her lips to mine. I was in heaven. But when her tongue entered my mouth, I became one with God. In general, that day the goddess gave me pleasure, and I almost lost my mind when I reached the finish line. It took me a while to gain self-awareness again, but when I did, the goddess stood face to face with me with her heavenly smile. I don't know how long I was in dreamland, but when I looked into her beautiful blue eyes, I felt like I was looking deep into her soul, watching sparks explode around me in the blue sea. Um, thanks, Bob. You had great taste. Now do me a favor and let yourself go. I need to get back to work. Oh, and if you happen to see my jerk of a husband... I'm guessing soon to be a jerk of an ex-husband. Explain what he's missing. She turned and walked back to her desk, leaving me standing there trying to button my pants. Before leaving, I took one last look at her in all her divine beauty. She had already lowered her head and was looking at the divorce papers. As I hurried out of the office, I saw a small, knowing smirk on the secretary's face. I now have a special place in my memory for Alethea Robertson. Will I ever see her again? Probably not. Will I ever get more? Without fail. In a dream. Every night. If I told anyone this story, I'm not sure they would still believe me. And if it ever came to my boss, I'd be looking for a new job in the morning. So, you can understand why I just keep this memory to myself and use it to enjoy being home alone in bed. This story was amazing enough but makes it pale in comparison to what happened a year later. I had to file under Delbert Davis. My boss said it might be difficult to serve, but our company guaranteed up to seven attempts before returning the documents to the court. I had to catch him anywhere, at home or at work. He turned out to be a very slippery person. When I walked into his apartment, I found it empty, and the man from the leasing office said Mr. Davis had moved out the week before. Of course, he didn't leave a forwarding address. I went to his work and was told that he no longer worked there. Using the resources of our office, I was able to obtain his cell phone number and use the same triangulation equipment that the police used to find out his location. So I got an address in the countryside outside the city. After some research, I found out that this was the address of one of Mr. Davis's friends. Finding the phone didn't mean I'd found it, but at least now I had a starting point. I wasn't sure if a direct approach would work, so I got permission to spy. That evening, I parked on the street near an old farmhouse. One device we use from time to time is an emergency pager. If I ever find myself in a situation where I need to call the police and I don't have the ability to do so, all I have to do is press a button and the police will be there in minutes. It was in my pocket because I had a bad feeling. I sat and looked at the house through binoculars. I didn't see anyone. Everything was quiet. Not even dogs or chickens were running. Behind the house, there was a large barracks-type building, but from where I was sitting, the door was not visible to me. I sat there until dark and saw that the lights were off in the house. I was pretty sure there was no one around, so I walked down the street to get a better look, staying under the cover of the bushes and trees along the road. There was still nothing there. I was almost at the entrance to the house, still hiding in the shadows, when I saw the barracks door open. The roar of a starting motorcycle filled the night air, and I rushed behind a tree. A few seconds later, 
A large custom Harley slid out onto the gravel road. It roared away from me in the opposite direction, into the night, and as the distance between us grew greater and greater, the roar died away. I couldn't tell whether it was the elusive Mr. Davis or not, but my better judgment was to retreat and regroup for the night. I did so and went home. In the morning, I returned to the farm and saw a motorcycle parked in the driveway. I stopped the car near the house, got out, and opened the hood, hoping that anyone who saw me would think that I had a breakdown. Pretending that I was tinkering under the hood, I looked at the house. A few minutes later, a man came out of the front door and lit a cigarette. He seemed to be watching me, leaning on one of the counters and puffing on a cigarette. A minute later, he threw away the cigarette and walked towards me. When he approached, I pretended not to see him. Problem guy, asked the man. I turned to look at him and recognized him as Mr. Davis. The day before at work, I saw a photograph in his file. Yes, actually, my car just died, and now I can't start it. I put a new battery in it a while ago, and I think one of the cables must have failed. Let's see what happens now. I got into the car and started it. Okay, it's all over now. I closed the hood and turned to the man. Hey, I know you from somewhere. Aren't you Delbert Davis? Yes. Do we know each other? No, you don't know me. But your wife knows. This is the official presentation. I tossed him a manila envelope and backed away to my car. I had just reached the door, reached over and picked up the tire iron from the seat when he smiled. So, Betty sent you to give me the papers? Who are you, one of her womanizing boyfriends? Here's what you can do with your papers. And then he reached behind his back and pulled out a pistol, the sun glinting on the chrome as he walked towards me, grinning. For the first time in my life, I was sure that I was going to die. I dropped the iron pry bar and put my hands on my head. Okay, asshole, go to the house and don't make any sudden movements. You don't want to leave a red stain on our beautiful front lawn. Now go. I followed his orders and walked down the driveway to the front door. Inside, he only grumbled. I was so scared that everything was shaking. I had no way to reach the emergency pager and get help, so I had to bide my time until I could. But I didn't succeed, because as I entered the door, I heard behind me a dull thud from a fall at my feet. I looked around cautiously and saw Mr. Davis lying in a heap on the floor, the back of his heed turning crimson red. Service you right, bastard, a voice growled from the other side of the doorway. Just outside the door stood a half-naked young girl. She looked no more than 14 or 15 years old, but something told me she was probably older. In one hand, she was holding something like a bed leg. The grimace on her face would have scared me half to death if I hadn't already been scared half to death. Come on, let's get out of here before his friends return, she told me, inviting me to follow her. I carefully stepped over the unconscious man and saw her running towards my car. Come on, hurry up! she shouted, turning around. So without thinking about what I had done or should have done, I ran after her. As I approached the car, I noticed that the manila envelope was still lying on the ground where it had fallen. I picked it up, ran back into the house and threw it at the door. You're still being served, bastard. Then I turned around, ran out into the yard and drove away as fast as my poor car could go. When we were about five miles from the farmhouse, I stopped at a small convenience store so we could catch our breath. That's when I noticed the bracelet on her left hand. But it wasn't a bracelet. It was part of a handcuff with a small piece of chain still dangling from the side. Thank you, she said, trying to cover her breasts with the torn top of her dress. Don't worry about Dell. I didn't hit him hard enough to kill him. I wanted to, but I just couldn't do it even after everything he did to me. Do you have anything I can wear? Cover up a little? Yes, sure. I reached behind the seat, took an old denim jacket that I kept in the car just in case, and gave it to her. As she put it on, I noticed that one breast was sticking out of the torn fabric, and there were a bunch of red marks on it, and a large bruise at the bottom. My name is Tracy, Tracy Winters. By the way, Thanks for saving me. What is it? I asked, pointing to the handcuffs on her wrist. Those assholes handcuffed me to the bed. I found a pair of pliers under the mattress, and it took me all night to open one of the links. I was just about to hit Dell over the head when you showed up. 
Why were you handcuffed to the bed? I asked, immediately thinking that I was sure I knew the answer. They took turns raping me and didn't want me to run away when I fell asleep. I don't know how long I stayed there, maybe four or five days. Crap. I'll take you to the police and... No, excluded. I can't risk them finding me and doing something worse, like cutting my throat or something. I just want to find a place to hide for a while. Later, I can negotiate to get out of town. Can't you help me? I really think I should take you to the police, or maybe to the hospital, and... Before I could finish my sentence, the air was filled with the roar of motorcycles. I looked in the rearview mirror and saw three pursuers behind me. Tracy hid in the seat so that no one could see her. Let's get out of here. These are the rest of the boys from home. Dell's friends. Just leave. As calmly as possible, I reversed and drove out onto the street. When we were some distance away, Tracy looked out the back window and visibly relaxed. Can you take me somewhere where I can hide for a few days? She begged. I don't know. I really think you should go to the authorities. But maybe I can put you up with me for a while. Any safe place, she whispered. Thank you. I am in your debt. When I returned to my house, she was fast asleep. I touched her arm to wake her up, and she jumped up, almost hitting her head on the ceiling. We're there, I said, pointing to my front door. I live in an old two-flat brick house that my uncle left me after his death. It's not fancy or modern, but it's comfortable and in a quiet area, and half of it is completely mine. I showed Tracy over and told her where she could get cleaned up and then went to find her something to wear. An hour later, she returned with wet hair wearing the sweatpants and sweatshirt I had prepared for her. I put out sandwiches and sodas, and she attacked them without even saying a word. After eating both of our sandwiches, a bag of chips, and drinking both sodas, she sat down and rubbed her belly. Thank you. I haven't eaten anything since yesterday. I was hungry. We left everything on the table and went out into the backyard to watch the sunset. I have prepared a spare room with clean sheets and towels, and you can stay in it until you find another place. You won't tell anyone I'm here, will you? No, I won't tell, I promise. Now tell me why you needed saving. She smiled for the first time, and it was a beautiful smile. I was an idiot, just like my whole life. As soon as I graduated from high school in Kansas, I wanted to go to Hollywood and become an actress. I actually went in the wrong direction, and this is how I ended up. Anyway, my parents are very strict and controlling, and they said I could get a job at a local grocery chain while I attend community college. It's been that way since high school, so a week after I turned 18, I just packed my suitcase and disappeared into the night. I signed up for a trip with a truck driver who said he was going to Los Angeles, but had to make a stop in Atlanta first. When we stopped for the night, he said I could sleep in his sleeper cabin, and he could lie in the driver's seat. An hour later, he was lying on top of me in bed, kissing me, and digging under my clothes. Finally, I closed my eyes and let him do what he wanted, because I couldn't stop him. When he had had his fun and fell asleep, I collected my belongings and slipped out. I met a guy at a diner, and he offered me a ride on his motorcycle. His name was Nate. He was one of those guys on the bikes behind us. He drove me away from the truck stop and about ten hours later stopped at the farm where you found me. There were three other men there, one of whom was Dell, but I can't remember the names of the other two. I stayed with Nate for a few days and we had a pretty good time. During the day he would put me on the back of his motorcycle, making some deliveries, and at night we would somersault. One night, a few days later, one of the other men got into bed with me and started drooling while trying to pull my clothes off. Nate wasn't there, so I screamed and kicked until he appeared at the door. He said he shared me with his friends and it's okay to do whatever they want. I said no, and started to get up and leave. Then they grabbed me and handcuffed me to the bed, and then they all started to lie down with me in turns. Everyone did what they wanted and then left, even Dell. But Dell suited me quite well. He still slept with me, but at least he brought me food and let me go pee when I needed to. He also put some ointment on my hand when it started bleeding under the handcuffs. Oh, by the way, do you have anything to remove this thing with? After working with a bolt cutter and a hacksaw, 
I was able to cut the handcuff in half and rip it off. I took some antibiotic ointment and put it on her cuts and gave her a tube to use where I can't see. We talked a lot. By the time the sun set, she was more relaxed than she had been since I first saw her with the bed leg in her hand, and she was completely exhausted. That night she slept in her room, and I slept in mine. The next day I went to work and reported that I had served Delbert Davis, but said nothing about the confrontation or Tracy. I could have gotten into a lot of trouble for simply taking her to my place and not calling the police, but I felt she needed help and wanted to be her hero. I drove home that afternoon and convinced Tracy to come with me to the clinic to get tested for STDs. The doctor prescribed her antibiotics and said that he would call her back in a couple of days to give her the test results. I took her home and went to serve the man at his work. Tracy stayed at my house for a week before she allowed me to take her out and get her her own clothes. We also ate, besides pizza, what I bought on the way home from work. Now that her battle wounds had healed and she had time to rest, she was much more pleasant and talkative. While we were eating, she told me the good news. Yesterday I called the clinic and they told me that all the tests were negative, including the HIV test. But they also told me that I needed to be tested again in three months because the incubation period for HIV can last up to a year. But for now, it looks like I'm okay. Thank you for saving me. It's my pleasure, and I thank you for cleaning the house. I'm pretty much a slob, and this apartment has never looked so good. You did a good job. I never told anyone about Tracy, but she liked to stay at home, watch TV, and play computer games. At that time, she had been with me for five weeks. One day, after a long day at work, I came home and smelled a home-cooked meal consisting of some kind of meat and potatoes dish. It smelled delicious, even if I didn't know exactly what it was. And since Tracy made it, it's delicious. Bob, I have good news. At least I hope you think it's good news. Today, I called my parents and told them where I was. I told my dad what happened, that you saved me, and that I've been living in your spare room for the past few weeks. His voice sounded hurt as he listened to everything, but he was glad that I was alive. He said he would send me some money so I could return home. Before I go, I want to thank you, and dinner is just the beginning. Then I want to take you out for an ice cream cone, and then take a walk around the neighborhood. Who knows what will happen after? The dinner tasted better and better. After that, I drove to a small cheap ice cream parlor near us and bought us both a cone. She had no money, but she promised to return it to me someday. I wasn't interested in money. We walked around the neighborhood and even sat and talked in the small children's park outside. She was sweet and even held my hand on the way home. As we walked upstairs, I had a strange feeling that the evening was not over yet. But when she said good night and closed the bedroom door behind her, I went to bed and fantasized about Alethea. Something woke me from a sound sleep, the warmth of a body next to me under the covers. It was Tracy. She pressed herself against me, placing one hand on my chest. I felt her breath on my neck and smelled the shampoo in her hair. But most of all, I felt her naked body against mine. I turned my head and looked at her. I could only see the outline of her head and the glimmer of her earring in the dim light coming through the blinds. She lifted her head to look at me, and I turned even more and our mouths met in the middle in a long, deep kiss. We kissed as if we had known each other all our lives. We made love tenderly, and at the same time passionately, for what seemed like an eternity. Before the night was over, we made love two more times and again at dawn, each more glorious than the last. Tracy stayed three more days before a money order arrived from her father to pay for her airfare home. We made love every day, or rather many times a day. Last morning she said she would never forget what I did for her and promised to email me or come back and meet me if she could. I was starting to fall in love with this girl, but I knew she still had a long way to grow up. Maybe me too. I took her to the airport and kissed her goodbye. I never saw her again, returning to work telling people bad news. Three years have passed since the episode with Tracy and Dell, and life has been both good and not so good for me, but I can't complain. I'm still filing for divorce. I also still fantasize about Alethea. Suddenly the phone on my desk rang. Mr. Adams, this is Hal from the front desk. 
Tracy Winters is here to see you. She says she owes you money. Can I skip it? Undoubtedly. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.